Hey guys, today we're going to be doing a full build of Airfix's brand new 1 to 24 scale Spitfire. So let's get into it and I hope you enjoy. So, as per most kits these days, this one doesn't differ. We start off in the cockpit, specifically with the chair. The chair utilises this sturdy interlocking system, which I really enjoyed. Once that's gone together, we mount the two side plates of the chair. These are moulded really nicely and sit onto the side of the chair with no fit issues whatsoever. After the side plates were installed, it was time to look at some of the bracing. Be careful with the bracing as the plastic is quite thin and there is a little bit of bending that needs to take place here. That being said, if you do take your time, you will have no issue whatsoever. I'd say now is an appropriate time to discuss what glue I'll be using for this build. So for the majority of my builds, including this one, I like to use Tamiya's Extra Thin Cement. This is because it's fast setting and relatively durable. Returning back to the build, you can see me finishing off the final stages of the bracing, with no bracing broken luckily. With bracing finished, it was time to move on to some more detailing. You can see me adding a couple details onto the seat here, and there were no fit issues here whatsoever, almost slotted into place. It's time like this where I really see the benefit of using Tamiya's Extra Thin, as it cements in place quickly and there's no need to hold it for long periods of time. Here you can see me utilising some micro drill bits just to add to the realism of the Spitfire. The joy of these micro drill bits is the price of them. They're really really cheap and they can really up your models, so I highly recommend. Here I am populating some of the floor of the cockpit with the details. I believe these bits which you can see me putting on here are to do with the framework. Continuing to build up the cockpit floor, here you can see me putting in the pivot point for the rudder pedals. Talking more generally about the kit, this kit seems to be engineered brilliantly, especially engineered in a way that really thinks about the modeler and the experience the modeler gets out of this model. They do this in really interesting ways, whether that be through designing the kit in a way that really helps you focus on getting the correct angles with your parts to make sure there's no misalignments and cause you issues down the line. And there's several other ways that they do it and I'm sure I'll cover them when we get to them in the video. But bringing it back to the build, uh, here I am seen constructing the rudder pedals for the cockpit. Went together brilliantly and uh, I'd also like to say here that everything seemed to look bang and scale to me except for one thing which uh, I, I, will, I will talk to you uh, about that when I get to it. Here I whipped out the trusty dusty uh, micro drill bits again just to add to the, the micro detailing and then it was on to some painting so this is also sped up I'm not that quick at my airbrushing don't worry I do take my time but uh, I was just giving the first initial base coat of um, Tamiya's cockpit green cannot tell you the XF number very sorry uh, but I, always, I like this cockpit green color I think it's the most accurate and it's uh, it's always a solid base to start to jazz up as I will show you in a second you might be asking to yourself what is that little crocodile clip doing down there well I pretty much just have a crocodile clip on a stick uh, I have a lot of them and I use them as sort of painting sticks to make sure I don't get as much paint on my hands However, I have just contradicted myself here as look where my hands are. Anyway, moving on, talking about what I'm doing currently. Uh, what you can see me doing here is highlighting these individual panels with my favourite colour on earth, buff. And what that pretty much does is it gives this sort of faded effect. Uh, the general theme that I had going into this build was I wanted it to look lived in but not grimy if that makes sense. I wanted it to be a clean looking build but I wanted it to have tonal variation and an interesting subject to look at. I'm also seen here trying out um, making a leather effect for the first time. So what I initially did is just painted the uh, chair a leather brown colour and then from there I got my trusty buff colour again and just kind of chipped it on there using the sponge chipping effect and then as you'll see in a second, I'll come, I'll come in and almost paint some very faint scratches down. I was quite happy with how this effect turned out. It's definitely not the best. And it's, I mean, I've seen some incredible, incredible depictions of leather through scale modeling. But it, I thought it was a pretty good start. Um, but do leave me tips on how to improve this because um, it's far from perfect. 
So yeah, here I am trying to emulate these sort of scratches into it. Because when you look at leather, it's very unusual that it's just completely brown, isn't it? You look at it and it's uh, it's got all these cracks and stuff in it. And it's usually a lighter colour or lighter shade of the brown, isn't it? And you know how much I love my buff. So I thought buff was a suitable colour for it. The way I'm trying to emulate these scratches is just by very, very lightly just kind of trickling my brush over the top of it um, in a random fashion. So after I was done with the leather, it was time to move on to some detail painting of some items in the cockpit. I have no clue what this component is, so please someone enlighten me. Uh, but I was just detailing them with my normal array of colours, whether that be metallic colours and also in this case I did have to use a bit of yellow as there was the yellow braided cables that the Spitfire has or pipes maybe. So then moving on to some more detail painting, this time on the control column. Uh, this time I was just using black. I'm pretty sure I was using Vallejo's black here. Vallejo colours also brush paint quite nicely. Uh, so I'd recommend them as well. The only real thing to be aware of, um, aware of, aware of with Vallejo paints is their um, opacity. It takes quite a few coats for them to build up that nice solid colour that you're looking for. It was then time to put the uh, all of the details into the cockpit. Do you mind the little camera bump at the beginning there? Uh, this also is a good time to point out how well you can see that faded effect with the buff, you know. It makes the, the cockpit look a little bit more interesting, but doesn't make it look all grimy and stuff. So here's a topic which I did quite want to discuss. Yellow paints. So I have tried quite a few yellow paints now, whether that be Tamiya paint, Tamiya XF, whatever it is, XF yellow we're going to call it. Um, I've also used Vallejo's yellow, however my favourite yellow when it comes to opacity has to be, and just ease to work with, would be Amos and Mig's yellow, it's lemon yellow I'm pretty sure I'm using here. So moving on to the instrument panel now, this was actually a lot of fun and was actually very easy, well maybe not easy, but they give you all of the different dials um, as separate pieces, so you don't have to worry about this silvering that goes over the entire thing. Albeit, it does take a while and you have to be very careful because some of the um, little stencils and decals are utterly tiny, but it does help you to get that positioning bang on. And the final result is, you know, it's near to none. It's the same as one of those photo etch sets. But to, to bring this effect uh, a little bit further, I wanted to try out something. It was using uh, my gloss varnish to create a sort of glass effect over it. However, it did go wrong, as you're about to see. I did actually drop it on the actual control panel. But I got it all sorted out. I, I kind of smeared it off and then sanded it back a little bit. It looks fine. Um, and it now has a really cool glass effect on it. I, I did then replicate this on, I believe that is the compass what I'm currently dipping something into, however I could be wrong. Um, but that is a pretty cool effect which is relatively simple if you don't have butterfingers like me. So after that was done it was back to putting a couple more details in and now starting to put like the instrument panel and a couple of the actual panels onto the floor of the cockpit. The, the way that these click into place is incredibly impressive. They slot in and honestly you probably wouldn't need glue. Like the, the, the fit is that brilliant, but of course do put a bit of glue, you know, you don't you don't want to be just relying on a snap fit model model, sorry. But they snap into place uh, perfect. And the system to get the sidewalls at the right angle, as I was saying before, is incredible. Just look at that snap and the, the fit is it's impeccable then time to feed the, the throttle and its braided cable through. It sounds like a little bit of a challenge but eh, it's fine, it's a nice locating pin on the floor. The real challenge, or at least for me it was a challenge, was trying to get these rudder pedals in. And yeah, it was really really hard but with enough wiggling they do actually get in there quite nicely. After the rudder pedals are in you put in the control column and then after the control column you put this almost brace for the as you can see on screen it's almost like I don't know what it is it's like a, maybe a protection thing so you don't step on the pipes or something I'm not too sure once again please someone enlighten me I do not know enough about the Spitfire but I would love to learn more uh, so yeah it's pretty much now just starting to tie everything together which I've been detailing 
uh, as you can see uh, that was painted in an earlier clip and it's just snipping them all together and um, they go together a treat you know everything goes together a treat like putting this seat onto the the frame I guess we can call it it was perfect you know nice locating pins nice places to apply glue and then it just snaps into place like so you know it was just it was a really nice way to start the build and in my opinion the cockpit does make or break a kit like if you're starting on a cockpit and it's been an absolute hassle maybe there's not enough detail or there's there's too much detail but it doesn't fit you're not you're not going to be excited for the rest of the build but you know i did this cockpit i think in about two or three days and i was buzzing every minute of it i was i was so ready to go so as i mentioned before i was going to point out when i thought something didn't look entirely in scale and we've got to that point it's the seat belt section they provide molded seat belts which i think is a first i don't think i've i've seen a kit which provides external sort of molded seat belts and these the seat belts look good however they're just a, a little bit chunky you know and a lot, lots of people who i've spoken to also agree they're just a little bit fat um but they're, they're pretty nice the the only issue i did slightly have with them is firstly because they're so fat they're quite hard to slide through this back plate and also mine were a little bit warped however this could have been due to me but I'm not too sure but I just used a heat gun to uh, heat it up and then slowly bend it back down a little bit I obviously didn't bend it enough as it still sticks up a little bit but it was it was a relatively easy fix anyway anyway with the fat seat belts all in and looking good it was time to go back on some more detail work this time on the other side side wall um, once again all of these pieces did fit with no issue whatsoever however I did find it quite interesting that one or two of the pieces here they didn't have set locator pins or like, like location marks they just kind of slotted in which I, I thought was quite a bold move I, I think people could definitely get mistaken there you know be like where does this meant to go but you know if you read the instructions right it does make it quite clear so maybe I'm just being a little bit picky there but going back onto the fit, this as well just snapped right into place, no issue, nothing overlapping, no no, no effort whatsoever. It was absolutely brilliant. And then when you see the cockpit all built up, you're, you're like, wow, just wow. I mean, it looks incredible. The Airfix team here have done an absolutely brilliant job there. So some eagle-eyed of you might have seen that white liquidy sort of glue didn't really look like extra thin cement that's because it wasn't it was pva glue sometimes when i'm mounting uh, a couple of the details i like to use pva glue purely because pva glue doesn't damage any parts or paint and you can just peel it off no issue whatsoever however on the other hand to actually connect the cockpit tub we'll call it to the fuselage i used a revel contactor this is because it is a stronger glue and it just gives you a stronger bond but it does have a slightly longer curing time so I did have to work out my thumbs a little bit making sure that stayed in place so moving on to the back here I'm not too sure why these two pieces were or these pieces which you had to put on here were provided as separate parts the only reason I can imagine is that they're going to have different marks of the Spitfire but using this as like their base kit so these um, back tail pieces could be modified to suit the mark if that makes sense anyway with all my crazy theories put aside going back to the build here i am putting together what i believe is the receiver for the spitfire this goes behind the seat i believe um, and this again really simple construction and fit into place a-okay however on the finished model i really couldn't see this like at all so putting together a couple more sub assemblies you had the tail wheel sort of mount and this just slotted in the back of the fuselage and then it was time to seal in all of my hard work so it was meeting the two fuselage halves together this was absolutely fine I only needed a couple of clamps and a bit of masking tape to ensure that the um the the join was correct and tight so while I was waiting for everything to dry and for it all to cure, I thought it was a good time to go on to do some more sub-assemblies. So here I am putting together some of the elevators and tail fins. These follow the normal sort of procedure nowadays. 
most of the time these are molded in two parts and the fit here was absolutely brilliant and be very careful to put the trim tab in before you um, close the two halves of the elevator together i very nearly forgot to do this so be very careful when you're doing that So FX utilised a very interesting design technique here for the tailplane. They um, had almost an overlapping sort of interlocking mechanism, which really gave an incredible amount of strength to these uh, tailplane, which was brilliant, brilliant to see. A very similar method was used with the elevators as well, but this time it was more like an interlocking spar. But once again, utilizes the same amount of strength. So there was no fancy way to lock in the uh, rudder to it, so I just used quite a lot of Rebel Contactor to make sure I didn't bash it off as I usually do when painting. So the gear bay construction for this kit is a little different to any other kit that I've done before, but different in a good way. It actually went together really well and I much prefer doing it this way to other ways that have been seen before where it's one solid piece and the solid piece doesn't match the right fit and oh, it, it just creates headaches. This one was just stress free and it, it, it looked brilliant as well. So in my opinion, 10 out of 10. This cylindrical looking sub-assembly is then connected to one of the many many formers which are used in the wing. It's slotted in with no issues whatsoever. It is then time to cement the wing spar into place. This wing spar is a little bit fiddly, so I would definitely take your time with this and make sure you use quite a slow setting glue, such as Revel Contactor. As you can see here, I gave up trying to film it. and uh, But I did get it done. It does go together quite easily, it's just quite hard to film it. So I did then leave the uh, wing spar to dry for a little bit, make sure it was fully uh, cured and cemented into place. And then it was time to get all of these wing formers and start to slot them into place. So I think it's a good time now to start to talk about what I, I briefly said earlier about the whole building experience of the kit. So coming into this kit, I was a little bit nervous about the wing. I thought there were an awful lot of parts and there was an awful lot of places that this could go wrong. However, Airfix's incredible engineering here meant that it was actually a lot of fun to build the wing section and everything just slotted into place, no issue whatsoever. I had no issues with guns, no issues with anything whatsoever. All of the angles and everything are bang on because of the wing spar and yeah it just slots into place and I find it really impressive from Airfix. I think it's a huge level up from them from some of their previous kits where they could actually try something like this and it maybe didn't have the best execution whereas here it, it, it just works flawlessly. So anyway, bring the attention back to the actual kit. Here you can see me putting in some of the side walls. I guess side walls is the right word to say for the uh, gear bay. I did actually paint these in the undersurface color before putting them in. However, I, I think it's a little bit counterintuitive because you're going to be painting that area anyway um, in the undersurface color. So may, maybe don't worry about painting them in the undersurface color before you put them in because you can just paint them in the undersurface color when you get around to painting the undersurface, if that makes sense. On the topic of painting, do you make sure that if you are displaying the guns in the open and like you can see the guns, do you make sure that you paint your wing formers in a metallic color or a color that you think is suitable? Because it is incredibly hard to paint them once all the wing and everything is on. And these um, these formers are actually going to be the side walls of your, your guns. So um, I, I almost fell into that trap, but I remember just before I did it. Following on from that point, make sure that you actually paint the bottom of the actual wing in the silver colour as well. Because when you do have that gun bay open, you can see down to the bottom of the wing. Albeit there has been some very, very clever placement of... Um, the gun and stuff to hide eject pin marks so I didn't worry about that and I can't see any of them when the model is finished so that's actually very impressive from Airfix but just make sure that you paint it in silver. So 
So here I am adding a couple of the details and the pipes to the gun bays. These all slotted in with no issue whatsoever. To add some interest, I did like to use a different type of metallic color. I believe here I used gunmetal gray and the bottom is like a polished metal color. Uh, and I think this added some nice detail into the kit. So I'd recommend doing the same with you. Here I am slotting in the ammunition into the ammunition tray, I guess we'll call it. This was actually slotted in really quite nicely and it was painted up just using some black, some metallic colors and also a wash. After that was done, I did repeat the process on the other side of the wing, however paid way less attention to detail as I wasn't going to be displaying the open guns on that side of the wing. Here I am fitting what I believe is a landing light into the wing. This slotted into place with no issues whatsoever and I did also use PVA glue here to prevent any fogging up. So it was then time to fit a couple of the guns and the cannons in. These are all initially painted with a Vallejo black and then dry brushed in a grey just to pick out a little bit of detail and make them look a little bit worn. When it came to the machine guns, these had a, a brace, I guess we could call them, that had to be fitted. I recommend not cementing the brace into place before you actually have it fitted into the wing, as these can move and you, I wasn't, it's quite hard to gauge where the brace um, has to sort of be angled to make sure that it fits properly, as you'll see here. I was being very careful when feeding them through this bar just to make sure that I didn't chip off any paintwork, however they do fit in there with no issue whatsoever. And you can see the bracket or hinge I think we called it, it just slots into two places on the formers which is a really good mechanism to be honest. So a little tip here is don't fit um, the ammunition loader I guess we could call it um, onto the machine gun before you've painted if you are going to be showing off the guns because that means the cover doesn't actually fit flush on top of it luckily I only fitted it with PVA glue so I could just kind of yank it off and not too much damage was uh, done but yeah there you go little tip it was then time to meet the fuselage with the wings. This had no real issues whatsoever, just once again needed a couple of clamps and a bit of masking tape. And here was it, it actually looks really cool, just like that with all the formers and the wings spar on the show. I wish I could have actually left it like that. So here you can see me fitting a couple of the panels to the wing which I wasn't going to be showing in the uh, open position. All these panels uh, literally clicked into place, probably some of them didn't even need glue. My tip for you here is just to double or triple check which wing you're putting the panels on before you do it because I was so close to putting the panels onto the piece of the wing which was going to then cover up all the work that I had done detailing the guns and that would have been an absolute disaster. So after you've got all your desired panels on, it's time to cement the top half of the wing to the bottom half of the wing and also the fuselage. This will go together relatively well. Uh, you do need to kind of move around and a bit of bending of plastic and stuff, but it only takes about five, six minutes to get everything in a way that you want it. And then of course use clamps and everything to sort it out. So as I'm opting to have Scheme A on my Spitfire, it needs elliptical wings. However, this does, um, vary on which scheme you're using so sometimes you have the clip wings and sometimes you have the elliptical wings. After that I repeated the process on the other side of the wing but this time of course you can see that there's no panels and these were held in place with my trusty clamps as always. I do recommend getting a couple of clamps because they are honestly lifesavers. So here is the construction of the tip of the wing, the tip of the elliptical wing. It is molded in two parts rather than one. I know quite a few manufacturers these days do it in one, or at least in one to 30 second scale, they usually do it in one piece. Uh, and no fit issues whatsoever and slots into the wing. So, after the wingtips were installed, it was time to go on to the radiators. So the radiators were kind of made up of this 
initial jig where pieces were fitted to it. On this jig, there was some really nice sim um, symbology. You see the two and then an up arrow and P. I believe there was P and SB, which means port and starboard. Maybe, not too sure, that's just a prediction. Um, and it just made it much easier to know where you were putting these parts. So another nice feature from Airfix. So here you can see what I mean by all of the pieces fitting to this main sort of jig. It works brilliantly, it's very, um, a very nice system. So after the final part was fitted, it was time to fit these onto the main um, assembly. These slotted into place with no issue whatsoever, however, do make sure that you are putting the right radiator on the right wing. So now moving on to making the ailerons. So as you saw, the, the ailerons use this sort of, I don't know, it's, it's like the trim tab where you have to kind of put it in between there and it, it, it allows you to like move them up and down I personally didn't like this system as it just it just created a little bit of an issue for me like I I, I, I appreciate the effort however it just feels unnecessary so coming into the final stages of assembly here you can see me fitting these pieces which shouldn't actually be fitted until after the engine is built however to make sure that they're the same color and they can all be painted at the same time as everything else i'm just cementing them here as you can see with a little bit of pva glue so on to fitting a couple of other things such as the antenna you have to be uh, careful here with the instructions and make sure you do use the right antenna and the right the right pieces for whatever marking and scheme you're going to be doing so just something to keep an eye out on when it comes to masking the canopy, I used my um, my toothpick and masking tape technique. If you don't know how that works or what it is, do check a previous video. I didn't go into it here as this is already an incredibly long video. So check out one of my F105 videos or my Hunter video, I discuss it there. All of the glass parts fitted with no issues whatsoever. However, I do always like to fit them with PVA glue now. Uh, just to reduce any chance of fogging and it also makes them easy to remove if something does go wrong or if I have forgotten to put something in the cockpit. So with the main assembly now finished it was time to go on to paint. I did start primer but then did luckily remember that I had to paint the canopy and cockpit green first. This is just because the inner frame of the Spitfire wasn't black and I use a black primer so it's more realistic if I use green. But with that sorted, it was then time on to primer. I use Ammo Mix One Shot Primer, I believe it's called, and I've always used it and it always works really well. Ammo's Mix Primer gives me a brilliant base to do my mottling effects. If you don't know what mottling is, mottling is pretty much um, an effect which gives you tonal variation in your paint and also accentuates the panel lines. I use it on most of my builds and I thought today I'd give you a little bit more in depth about how I do it. So here I'm using Vallejo's Insignia White as the paint and pretty much I use about 15 PSI and as you can see I do this continuous sort of movement and I'm just very very careful on the amount of paint that I pull. It takes a while but the effect is well worth it. It's also a good tip to try and be at 90 degrees to your model. This just prevents any overspray going onto the panel lines. As you saw, I did do that. So now that you've seen a couple of clips of uh, individual panels being done, I thought we'd give you a little bit of a time lapse over doing an area of it. I'm using the exact same technique here. Nothing has changed. It's just sped up footage. I don't think I'm going to be sticking to doing modeling forever, as I have seen there are other pre-shading and also post-shading techniques out there. I think this is going to be a challenge for me in 2023 to try out. I saw a really cool technique on um, Instagram which probably saves me a lot of work. It's the same sort of modeling effect but they use the actual colour that would be used. So in, in our case it's an ocean sea grey and also a forest green and they use that to do the modeling and then go over it in that colour. Um, and, and it gives the exact same effects and probably a more natural effect. Some people say that this is almost um, a Spanish way of modeling. The Spanish way of modeling has very accentuated panel lines, which is what um, pre-shading and modeling does. And I, I do really like it. I know some people don't, 
but using this sort of um, the actual color to do the pre-shading gave a much more natural looking effect. But after a very long stint at the um, at the booth, it was all finished. Um, I thought it actually looked really cool like this. Um, I always like what it looks like after it's been mottled, but it was quite nice, uh, neatish um, mottling from me. So I, I knew it was going to provide a good base for the rest of the camouflage. So the entirety of my camouflage here was actually freehand painted. Uh, the way that I do this is I have the very nicely provided paint sheet scheme from Airfix on my left and I'm just kind of trying to translate it over by eye. It isn't incredibly accurate, however the result is pretty good. So when it comes to paint, I'm using Ammo MIG paint. Uh, specifically, I got these paints in a Ammo MIG paint set. They do these brilliant paint sets, which are uh, have all the paints that you need to do a certain type of aircraft, whether it be US Navy or in this case RAF World War II. But they also do like RAF Modern Day as well, and they're brilliant sets. And I really enjoy working with um, Ammo MIG paints. I know they have a little bit of a mixed review, but I really enjoy them. Talking more about how I actually do the painting of the camouflage, what I initially do is do the outlining stage, as I said, using the paint sheet to get the general outline and shape of the camouflage. And then I'll come back and very, very lightly start to fill in and build up the color on the interior of the area. When I'm doing this, I, I like to do it lightly, purely because I don't want to lose the mottling effect, which I, I do spend an awful long time doing. It can sometimes take up to three hours I think it took to do the mottling on this model so to lose that just over having too um, hard of paint flow would be not, not, not a, a brilliant use of time. So as I've now used this effect for uh, quite a few of my models, uh, at least most of the models on my channel, the, the key to making it look effective is the, the building up of light coats and also standing back like you, you might have it at a certain place and just just you know stop painting for a second stand back look at it from different light bring it into another room just just see what it looks like and if you're happy with it and that that's just the way to to see if you if you're you're truly happy with the effect because the lighting in your spray booth it, it is sort of it is very different isn't it to normal lighting so looking at it in different lighting places whether that be natural light artificial light is a, is a good tip to make sure you're always happy with the effects that you are producing albeit this isn't about the actual painting however as you are now looking at the tail you can see the trim tabs I did actually have to cement these trim tabs in place as because as I discussed earlier you kind of sandwich them in between the two pieces mine were way too loose and they just droop down at like a 90 degree angle and I don't know if you ever know or if you guys have ever seen trim tabs um, they are never at a 90 degree angle they're, they're usually only in very very minute sort of adjustments uh, for the pilot's liking so I thought I, I can't have them at 90 degrees so I whipped out a little bit of um, Tammy's extra thin and just did a, a streak along there and held it in a in a slight angle uh, downwards I think So for some reason, I'm not too sure why, but I didn't record as much of the painting of the, the ocean grey colour as the green colour. However, I did use the exact same method. There was no difference. It was just um, building it up in thin layers again, looking at it from different lighting points, tracing along the green outline and the exact same method. So no changing there. So you might be able to see the panels here and they don't look very flush. This is because we are on the side of the wing that um, the, the guns were going to be showing off as. And as you can see, the, the cannon um, panel, which has a little bit of a bubble in, that is only sitting flush because I did remove the, um, 
the ca the ammo loader. Is it called an ammo loader? Please do let me know. Honestly, my terminology for the Spitfire is shocking. So you might think this is a slightly different camera angle to what we usually have on the channel and this is just because my spray booth is not big enough to handle this model. This model is massive. I know on video it's always quite hard to gauge the size of um, everything but um, if, you, if you don't already know the dimensions the wingspan of this model is about 50 centimeters long and the, the length is about 40 centimeters long. I think that's right that's off the top of my head. Uh, so yeah, so some of these camera angles are a little bit iffy, but that's just because of the sheer size of the model. I'm personally not complaining, I love the big model, uh, but that could actually be something to think about when you are purchasing this model. Do you have the space um, to, to fit it? But if you do have the space, please do pick it up, because it is a brilliant model to build. So going back to the model, here you can see me taking off some of the masking tape to reveal a nice crisp line. Talking of lines or stripes, it was time to do the invasion stripes. So this was actually my first time doing invasion stripes. However, um, Airfix's marking sheet made it quite easy to do them. They do recommend the, the thicknesses and tell you the thicknesses so you don't have to worry about trying to uh, figure out what scale they would be in and whatnot. Uh, but they said they recommended 10, 10.5, I believe, 10.5 millimeter stripes. So I just kind of lined five of them out and, um, you know, it was quite self-explanatory. Just line five of them out, take the two of the middle of them off and then spray. That would be black and then spray two in the middle and do white, you know. It was quite simple and if I can do it, this was my first time doing it and they came out brilliantly, then I'm sure anyone could do it with no issue whatsoever. Uh, my tip would be though for the white is to go in much thinner coats than I did because I almost drowned a couple of the, the details out there uh, but I did kind of rub that off and, and try it again. I, I didn't film it because I was a little bit embarrassed but um, yeah just be mate, mate, make sure that you're very thin on your coats of white and it will work brilliantly. So if anyone was interested at in what masking tape I use, if you saw the yellow pieces of masking tape, they are Tamiya's um, masking tape, and the green pieces of masking tape, that is frog tape. I've always enjoyed working with uh, Tamiya's masking tape. I don't think I've ever had any major sort of leakages, and if there were any leakages, it's usually because I haven't pushed it down properly. So once the white was all painted on, I then masked off the white areas and painted the black. Here I believe I'm using Vallejo's black. Um, I always like Vallejo's black, although it isn't the most resilient, it is quite easy to scratch off, so be careful with that. And look how satisfying that is. Um, also, another tip which I have actually found over the years of now modelling, is when you are um, masking, try and remove the masking tape as quick as possible. It just reduces the chance of any of those sort of ridges um, forming from the paint drying next to the, the tape. So that's a little tip for you, which I've found very, very helpful. So this process of doing the invasion stripes was repeated on the, the tail section of the fuselage as well. However, this time, instead of using Tamiya's um, 10 millimeter um, masking tape, I had to cut it down to about 8.6 millimeters, which did take a little bit of time. However, you know, if it's in scale, that's all that really matters, right? I always think it's quite necessary to record any uh, time I take off the masking tape because it's always just so satisfying seeing the lines created. Do you agree? Do you let me know. So with all of my invasion stripes and my general painting all finished, it was time to move on to making the Merlin. The Merlin was uh, honestly my favourite part of this kit. It was so much fun to make and it, it, was, it was just a really fun experience. Also, the out-of-the-box detail was actually really, really impressive. So Airfix have really outdone themselves here. And there's all this detail, but well, there's no good of having all this detail if it doesn't fit good. However, this did fit brilliantly. There's also an awful lot of really small parts, uh, like that one, which I did lose, but then I found it again. So th thumbs up from me. And all of these small little parts just fit perfectly as well. So it's just a really brilliant building experience. Speaking more specifically about what is actually happening in the video, you can see that I built up two of these sort of uh, places where the pistons I believe go and then they are mounted to this main sort of strut uh, which gives you the correct angle and then it fits onto the initial sort of um, base piece that you made. 
and it, it, it comes together really quite quickly. I think all of this came together in about an hour before I had to start painting stuff. Uh, with all the small little pieces uh, attached as well, like there's another one there. Um, but I, I know I say that there's all these small pieces, but if you have a good pair of tweezers, it, it's absolutely fine. And maybe a good pair of eyes, so maybe a magnifying glass could be a little bit helpful as well. So a quick tip with this sub-assembly is to be very careful when you're pushing it in, because you have these two... Oh, they, they, I don't know what they are. I don't know the Merlin good enough. However, these two pointy prongs which stick up and you have to be very careful just grab a pair of tweezers and just kind of because there's two locating places where they go in as you can see there um so just make sure that they are guided into the right place otherwise you could break them off or they, they just won't look right so here i am putting together what i believe is it, it looks like a fuel it isn't a fuel tank but a place where fuel goes <laughs> um so I, I did cement that together and then i also sanded that down and used a little bit of filler just to slightly just slightly hide the seam there was a little bit of a seam there and that was going to be center front of the uh, engine so that was something to sort out and here i am making a, a box I, I'm not too sure what it is I'm, I'm really sore <laughs> I'm really sorry I, I'm just not too sure what all these parts are it looks so complicated it looks sick but it looks complicated um but th this thing looks a little bit like a turbo I, honestly I'm gonna get absolutely rinsed in the comments but you know I, I'm ready for it I'm ready for it um so please do enlighten me about what all of these parts are or guide me to a video which explains the merlin i tried to look for one but i couldn't really find one which looked interesting but then those two assemblies are put together and then it is put onto the main assembly and clicks into place no issue whatsoever so then there's another uh, sub assembly i believe this is one of the last sub assemblies they once again, couldn't tell you what it is. However, I do know that this part then does click into an intake that goes in the front. So maybe something to do with a, uh, I don't know, cooling system or maybe even just an intake system for, you know, actual air and fuel combustion. Who knows? But anyway, after that was done, it was time to put all of the wires and really busy it up. Um, a lot of these wires are a little bit out of shape, so I do recommend using something like extra thin cement, which has a really fast cure time, so you can just put it there, hold it there for a couple seconds, and it will be uh, there ready to go. It's quite soft plastic, it isn't very rigid, so uh, there's not too much of a risk that you're going to break it, but just be, be on the safe side and be very careful with them. So there was this big wire complex system. It looks like a fuel injector system. Oh, I might have got that one right, actually. Um, so they all slot in as well. Uh, the cleanup on the very tips of the um, wire or tube wire, uh, you'd be very careful with that because this, this piece is very, very fra fragile and there is a lot of cleanup that has to be done on it. Um, but once you do have that done, uh, it clicks into place with relative ease, just a little bit of uh, positioning needed. Then there is another set of wires which have to be connected to the one of the original sets of wires. It is honestly, it's an utter, utter complex of wires. And then that piece, <laughs> a set of wires has another piece of wires that connects to it. There's just an awful lot of wires and pipes and everything. But it's, it's an awful lot to, um, a lot of fun to build. I know I'm probably making it sound like it's a little bit of um, a hassle, but it's, it's very, very fun um, and no real issues whatsoever. And with all of those wires and everything, and the, the last few sub-assemblies and pieces clicked on, which I still have no clue what they are, uh, it definitely did start to look like a very busy and a very good looking Merlin. So here I am putting together what I believe is called a chin tank. Please do correct me if I'm wrong. This had about three parts to it. So you had the upper part and then sort of the, the bit at the front to enclose it. Once again, no issues here, no filler needed, no... no clamps or anything just slots together no issue whatsoever so um, I didn't actually film the painting of the Merlin because the Merlin was just painted a complete black but I am going to show you all about the detail work that happened with it so if you do want your Merlin uh, no not your Merlin your propeller to spin do not cement that part as you saw I didn't put it in there and then it just slots on there you could probably cement the other bit but it, it had such a good fit that there was no real need and as you can see there all painted in black and there's just a couple of the fuel tanks and everything being slotted onto it 
So here you can see me starting to paint some of the, the pipes and the details. All of this painting of the metallic colour was done once again in Ammo Mig's um, metallic colour range. I love them for brush painting. I think I've already discussed this in the video. Um, but they just, they, they're brilliant to work with. I did use a, a variety of the metallic colours. I didn't just use one type of metallic colour. I think I used a polished metal colour, a steel colour and a gun metal colour. Uh, to create all sorts of different effects. Here I am just picking out a couple of the, the bolts or rivets. I didn't do all of the tiny tiny ones because I thought I would probably mess that up and make it look a little bit, a little bit iffy. So for example here I don't think I'm using a polished metal colour, instead I'm using a gun metal colour. I'm not too sure if it's very accurate, however it just added a little bit more interest rather than just seeing one type of metallic colour, you saw a couple, so it just added a little bit of maybe wear and tear. Speaking of jazzing up, here you can see me um, absolutely scrubbing the hell out of this thing and this is called dry brushing. I'm dry brushing on a grey colour here just to uh, accentuate any of the raised details. I really do like this technique and I love the effect that it gives. It almost gives like a 3D looking effect, even though I know it is 3D, but it, it just brings the paint out a little bit more. And also you can, it just creates a couple of scratches sometimes as well, which is always nice to see. And that is my finished Merlin. So on to a slightly less enjoyable experience. It was creating and um, building the, 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 the sort of the framing and the support work for the engine. It started off very nicely with this jig, um, which is used to uh, for the, the frames to sort of slot into and it, everything fits really, really nicely. Um, and this piece here fits nicely. However, I would recommend once again using a similar technique to what I used before, where's a bit of extra thin and just kind of hold and pinch it there for a second as you'll see in the clip. On the whole I did quite like building this frame um, but there was just one monumental thing which just completely put it off for me. So I don't think I filmed too much of this part here however it was just kind of populating this uh, I, I, I don't think it's firewall but we'll call it a firewall uh, just populating it with a couple of parts um, and then as you, you're just painting it with a cockpit green colour. Here you can see me just painting the um, the sort of the top of the engine covers in a silver colour because I, I wasn't going to leave it as a uh, the, the bare plastic colour and I thought that the silver suited it quite well. Right here is the issue. It was trying to fit these pipes through this really fragile frame without breaking it. Luckily I didn't break it, however it took me so so long. As you can see this clip is sped up by about 300% but this is like, it, it took me about 45 minutes to, to get this thing in there without any issue whatsoever and I'd completely destroyed the paintwork. Um, of both the frame and also the pipe which was um, in a burnt sort of iron colour which I quite enjoyed as you can see there it is but I did eventually get it in there so it is possible uh, my tip is just take it very very slow and also feed it through from the right hand side first and then almost twist it and push it back through not a brilliant explanation but it does work so just stick with it but once all the pipes and everything is stuck to the frame, this is then connected to, I'll call it the firewall again, that's what we'll call it. Um, these, it slots in quite nicely. There is just a, quite a bit of um, wiggle and it's just quite quite hard to get that thing to wiggle in there. Uh, but it can be done and it does uh, go in eventually, but just be once again, I was just being very, very careful. I didn't want to put any force through this thing because it is quite fragile. And then once that is in and secure, it's time to put the Merlin on. Uh, this this is actually really, really good, a uh, really good system. They have uh, about four really nice locating pins on it. Well, they're not pins, they're sort of locating slots um, and it slots in, no issue whatsoever. Once it is slotted in though, uh, you have to connect these pipes, so give them a little bit of a wiggle and connect it to that fuel tank area uh, up top, as you can see. It's then time to add a couple more details. I'm not too sure what this part is again, but it is connected and then it also connects onto the engine. Uh, slots in really nicely again, no issue here whatsoever. 
So then time to mount the, the chin tank. This chin tank slots in, no real issue whatsoever. Uh, a couple nice uh, sort of locator places because they're not pins but they locate on nicely and this also does slot in quite nicely as well however be really really careful because you have to put an upwards force on it and it, you could probably pop your merlin out if you're not too uh, too careful I, I know i nearly did i felt it almost pop out and i almost had a heart attack so it is then time to move on to the the gear and the gear legs and everything this was actually a really nice assembly there was no real issue here whatsoever i really like the tires as well i discussed it in my unboxing video but i found it really funny that there was a like a do not logo on the tires I, I just thought that was a really funny and nice detail to have on it these gear legs were then painted in a steel color and then i did pick out the uh, shock absorber place with a, uh, a different metal just to just to distinguish it they do suggest this in the instructions and it is very realistic so you know if you have different colors of uh, metallic i do recommend doing it and then the hub which is created out of two parts then slots into the gear not the gear sorry the the tire and that you know no issue whatsoever so this isn't really an issue but more of just to be careful make sure that you push your gear leg the entire way into that spar uh, whether that be maybe that you have to sand a little bit just uh, get the paint off of it make sure that it can slide all the way in with no real friction but uh, what well, you want some friction to make sure it's still strong but just make sure it slides the whole way in so a note of warning is make sure that you mount your wheel correctly unlike I did here I did correct it I, I noticed it as soon as I uh, stopped recording um, but just make sure that the, the sunken part of the uh, tire is facing the correct direction and here is the issue that you have if you don't push the gear leg the whole way in. You see how it is restricting me from fitting this piece correctly. However, there, there was quite an easy fix. However, I did just kind of have to shave off a, a line of the rivets, as you can see there. I'm pointing with my tweezers, and that, that was just a quick little fix. And then after that fix was finished, it was time to put on the main gear cover, I guess we can call it. And that slots in, no issue whatsoever. So I forgot to paint the uh, the yellow stripe that goes on the wing and this was actually my first time using Tamiya's flexible masking tape to do this and it, was, it worked really really well. It, it's much easier to bend of course than a normal masking tape which is probably why they call it flexible masking tape. However that was done and then there was a base white layer using Vallejo's Insignia White and then Ammo's MIG Lemon Yellow. And then there you go, peeling it off, uh, no leakages or spillages and uh, really nice. So I've never got on with the decals which are meant to be the, the gun covers. So I opted to mask them off and paint them in red and it, and it worked really well. So speaking of masking, here you can see me masking off an area for the, the which kind of replaces the walkway decal. Uh, I do this just because I didn't really want to risk any silvering and also I prefer the painted look on effect. Um, it takes a little like half an hour but it's well worth it and I do recommend doing it. But yeah, the way that I did it is I just kind of took a snippet of the decal, used it as a template and I used that on both wings and it, it worked really well. So this was done four times as well for each propeller. Interesting that they used two parts for it. So here you can see me chipping or using a chipping effect on the nose. I did um, see quite a few models which have this beautiful looking chipping effect on the nose and I thought it looked really, really authentic. So I thought it would be a good time to give it a little bit of a try. So the way that I did this was uh, a silver coat first. Then I did a layer of the chipping fluid, Ammo's um, chipping fluid. Uh, or is it MIG? One of the two, but a chipping fluid and then the base color and then you use warm water to chip it all off and that was my effect. I also did this on the prop, uh, however instead of using a brush I just used a toothpick and gently kind of scattered it along to create this sort of sun bleached effect. I really really liked how it looked, let me know what you think. Here you can see all four of the props being fitted into this main sort of hub and then another piece is put on the hub and then the hub is put onto the, um, the back plate of the, the nose cone and then the nose cone is fitted on top. No fit issues here, really nice sort of sub assembly or installation. There you can also see the rest of the chipping which I did. And with the propeller fitted, that was the, the assembly kind of finished. 
So with the assembly then finished, it was time to go on to decals. So the decals in this kit um, are brilliant. They are airfix, they are vibrant, they are thin. Um, if, if you know airfix decals and you've done an airfix kit before, you, you'll know the quality. But uh, airfix is definitely up there as one of my favorite kit manufacturers when it comes to their decals. All of them are brilliant. I never really have any issue with them silvering or falling apart. And although I didn't film it, uh, there was a little bit of a modification that had to be made. If you are displaying the guns, you are going to actually have to cut out some of your roundels and stuff like that. So I had no clue how to do this and I was having a little bit of a, a, a breakdown about it. And I asked uh, my good friend on Instagram, Ashton, Model Aircraft 54, and he said to put the, the panels, the gun panels, onto the um, aircraft, apply the decal, uh, let it cure and then cut it out and it, it worked an absolute treat and it is, is so much so much cleaner than uh, trying to you know cut them beforehand it, it works an absolute treat however it would be quite nice if airfix did provide decals which had these sort of slots already cut out so here you can see me just putting a couple of the stencils on i didn't want to film every single decal because i i use the exact same process for each decal and I find it a little bit boring but do please do tell me in the comments if you want to see more of the decal application I'll be more than happy to do that but with decals done it was time to put a bit more of the bracing onto the engine this really makes the engine look a little bit more structured doesn't it so I don't know why I left it so long to put it on but this snapped into place no issue whatsoever and then it was time to fit in the exhaust pipes. So the exhaust pipes were, um, there were sub assemblies. They're made out of two parts and they just kind of click together and then snap into place. I didn't film it because there was just an awful lot of them and it, it just took a very, very long time. Uh, but yeah, uh, with that, it was, it was finished. So before I show off this utterly magnificent model, not because I built it, but because it, it's just a brilliant kit, um, I'd like to say a Merry Christmas to everyone, as this is being um, filmed on Christmas Eve. Uh, so Merry Christmas to everyone and a Happy New Year. Speaking of New Year's, I'm very excited to see what uh, 2023 holds for this channel. We will be continuing to make lots and lots of models uh, and probably lose lots of parts and get my fingers stuck together lots and lots of times. But anyway... Without further ado, here are the final photos, so hope you enjoy them and uh, bye bye, I'll see you next time.